Hello, our next topic is the Laplace transform, and we're going to be using Laplace transforms throughout to simplify our analysis of convolution systems, and the really key reason for using Laplace transforms is that they turn convolutions into multiplications. So that's sort of the why, and we'll get into that uh, later. Today we're just going to introduce the Laplace transform and uh, a few of its properties. Hopefully this is um, a refresher for most people. So what is it? Um, if you look on Wikipedia, you might find two um, different definitions of the Laplace transform, depending on whether you're looking at one-sided or two-sided Laplace transforms. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. We're going to be using one-sided Laplace transforms from for everything after this lecture, but we'll talk a little bit about two-sided Laplace transforms today. Um, so let's just start with the one-sided Laplace transform. Maybe I should put a, a one in here or something to distinguish it, but we're going to be using this exclusively in the future, so I'll just call it L. And what does it do? Well, it takes as its input some signal defined as a function of time, and it transforms it into a function of s. And how does it do that? It does it through an integral. So the Laplace transform takes as its input some function of time, and it transforms it into a function of s. Um, according to this integral, you might often see people put a little minus sign in here. This is just to the sort of slightly funny ways to rigorously incorporate delta functions um, or delta distributions, which you talked about a little bit in the last lecture, as sort of this um, the limit of uh, various functions as you squeeze them and make them narrower and narrower and taller and taller. And so you have this little zero minus to indicate that you're slightly to the left of one of these deltas. Um, and so inside our integral, we have our function x of t, and then it gets multiplied by e to the minus st, and then we integrate with respect to time. So this is the one-sided Laplace transform, and it's fairly typical um, to uh, designate the transformed uh, x of t with a capital X as a function of s. So this is the um, one-sided Laplace transform. And you might also see defined the two-sided Laplace transform. This is exactly the same, but now the limits of integration have changed. So what is all this about? Um, so these are our two Laplace transforms. Why don't we just uh, do some examples to begin with? Um, so. For example, let's study these two functions, f1 of t. And this is going to be the function that is equal to e to the minus t for t greater than 0. And it's going to be equal to z, uh, 0 otherwise. Um, and then we'll have f2. Got to be careful. Don't run out of space. And this is going to be uh, the opposite. So I'm going to have 0, let's say, for t greater than 0, and minus e to the minus t for t um, less than or equal to 0. So uh, we've got this function 1, function 2. What happens when we use these Laplace transforms, uh, these two different ones on? Uh, this signal. What sort of interesting features can we learn about these um, the, 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 these transformations? So, the first thing to note is that the Laplace transform of x of t is equal uh, not x f one. So, if I Laplace transform f one of t, this is equal to the two sided Laplace transform of f1 of t. And this is because f1 is only non-zero for um, 
positive values of t. And so this is something to sort of have in mind. Um, for the rest of the course, we're going to be talking about one-sided Laplace transforms, and we're also just going to be talking about signals defined for positive times or causal impulse responses, which are also functions that are just defined for positive time. And really, this is a lot of the reason why we use one-sided Laplace transforms, because they cover everything you need, and as we're about to see, you can avoid confusing yourself with some ambiguous uh, cases, particularly when thinking about inversion um, of the using the two-sided Laplace transform. But when we have all of these functions that are zero for negative time and causal impulse responses, there's no real difference. We're just choosing to use uh, the one-sided Laplace transform. So fine. Um, and uh, what else can we see? Well, we can see that the Laplace transform of f2 of t is equal to zero because it's just zero for all positive values of t. Um, so that's not so interesting either. Um, and so all of the interesting cases now are, well, we can calculate these and we can also calculate the um, two-sided Laplace transform of f2. But let's uh, start with the two-sided Laplace transform of f1, which is the same as the one-sided one. Um, so there we would have um, the, the integral from 0 to infinity of our function, which is e to the minus t, and then e to the minus st dt. Um, so this is what we need to integrate. Let's just combine these exponentials so we keep our integral, and then we have e, let's have a minus sign, and then 1 plus s t dt. So this is just combining these exponentials here. And now we do the integration, and we get minus 1 over s plus 1 e to the minus 1 plus s t and we evaluate it in our limits. So our limits are 0 and infinity. And what do we get? Well, as we send t to infinity, this thing collapses down to 0. And maybe it's time to start thinking about when or for what values of s this would collapse down to 0. But let's just say ah, we've got a minus sign here. t gets really big. Exponential of something minus goes to 0. So that's 0, and then when t is equal to 0, the exponential here just becomes 1. So we follow all of that through, and we get 1 over s plus 1. So that's the Laplace transform of f1. How about the Laplace transform of f2? Maybe you can already start to see where this is going. So now we have the integral from minus infinity to 0. f2 is 0 for positive values of t, so we just need to look at this integral here. And it's exactly the same thing in here, but with a minus sign. So now we have minus e to the minus t, e to the minus st dt. And following all the same steps and noticing that we just had a minus sign here, we would end up evaluating 1 over s plus 1 e to the minus 1 plus s of t, 0, infinity. And then by exactly the same uh, minus infinity, um, by exactly the same reasoning, we might uh, come to the conclusion that this is 1 over s plus 1. We might be a bit more worried this time. I mean, uh, it was clear there's got a minus sign here. We make t very, very large and positive. This is obviously going to collapse down to 0. This one, hmm, yeah, not so clear. We've got the minus sign, but now t is going to minus infinity. So minus, minus, surely that's going to explode. Um, but the key thing to start thinking about is this will collapse down to 0 for certain regions of, or certain values of s 
So, and, and the same is true for this one. The limit as t goes to infinity will only give us something that collapses down to zero for particular values of s. And the rest of our intuition was correct. Um, so uh, we're just going to start chopping up the s plane and trying to identify in which regions do these interval, uh, integrals converge and which in, uh, regions they don't. And this is really the key message. Notes. Yeah. Integrals converge for some values of S. And the, the range of values of S for which they converge is called the region of convergence. And the Laplace transform only makes sense um, and is, is only defined on the region of convergence. So what are the regions of convergence for these two cases? Well, in order for this to go to zero, we need the coefficient in front of um, RT. We need this thing to be positive. So let's draw a picture of the S-plane. So this is the complex plane. I've drawn a picture. So complex plane. And this is corresponding to different values of s. So if s is real, as long as s is bigger than minus 1 and it's real, then this co coefficient here is going to be positive. And if this, is, if this is positive, when t gets very, very large, indeed e to the minus st is going to tend to 0. And we were correct in saying that the evaluation of this integral is equal to 1 over s plus 1. So minus 1, sort of what we've managed to conclude by talking about all of this is that if s is anywhere, so these values, values of s, this, uh, th th this expression here does tend to 0 as t gets very large, and 1 over s plus 1 is the Laplace transform of f1. So certainly for these values of s. And now we can see immediately that the opposite thing is going to happen here. As long as s is less than minus 1, then um, this term here will be negative. So this term here is positive. So as t goes to minus infinity, this whole thing is going to go to 0. So the, the the Laplace transform of f1 converges for these values of s, and the Laplace transform of f2 converges for these values of s. What about uh, complex values of s? Well, if we remember, e to the some real number plus some imaginary number, the size of this is equal to, well, it's just equal to the size of e to the j omega e to the sigma. And so if omega is real, j omega is imaginary, this is just some point on the unit circle. And so the size of this is equal to e to the sigma. So the size of the expression that we're looking at only depends on the real part of whatever's in here. And in fact, if you stop and think about it for a bit, what we see, or well, what that means is that the Laplace transform of f1 is converging for all of these values of s, and the Laplace transform of f2 is converging for all these values of s. So. The sort of take-home message of, from all of this is that when looking at Laplace transforms, the transformation is only valid for particular values of s, and those val values of s, we find them by looking at when the integrals converge, and that region is called the region of convergence. And in order to make sense of the Laplace transform, you have to keep track of what the region of convergence is, um, because we see here these two functions, they're different, but they had the same Laplace transform. The only caveat was that the regions of convergence were different.
Um, so transformation comes with a region of convergence, and the lower class transform is only valid for the region of convergence. You probably also spotted something else um, that's going on here. Interestingly, the region of the convergence seemed to have something to do with the poles of this Laplace transform. So the poles are the values of s for which um, uh, this thing explodes. And so here we see the pole is at the value s is equal to minus 1. So this is our pole. And what we've now noticed was that the Laplace transform of f1 converged to the right of the pole, and the Laplace transform of f2 converged to the left of the pole. And these are general properties of functions that are either only defined for positive time or only def uh, defined for negative time. And if a function is defined for positive time, the Laplace transform converges to the right of its poles and the converse, yeah, to the right of its rightmost pole. So if we had a very simple example here where the Laplace transform was just 1 over s plus 1. If we got something more exotic like 1 over s plus 1 multiplied by 1 over s plus 2, so we'd have a pole at minus 1 and, a minus, and also at minus 2, then the Laplace transform would only converge for values of s to the right of minus 1. And then the opposite would be true for um, uh, the sort of anti-causal signal, so a signal that's only defined for negative time. And if you like, we sort of come in a very roundabout way to the reason why we um, focus on one-sided Laplace transforms and signals that are defined for positive time. So first of all, they cover everything. Looking at signals for positive time covers everything we need because the impulse responses of uh, causal systems are zero for negative times. And also, we have this sort of simple rule about convergence of Laplace transforms for signals that are defined for positive time. And that rule is that the region of convergence, which we need to keep track of in order for the Laplace transform to make sense, is always to the right of the rightmost pole of the one-sided signal that we're Laplace transforming. And note this doesn't mean that the function has to be bounded. Um, so if I replace this with e to the t, and we repeated everything, we'd get an s minus 1 here, and then our Laplace transform would converge um, for values of s to the right of 1 rather than minus 1. So this framework allows us to capture instability also. Um, but the, this is all sort of good to know, um, and uh, I guess there's sort of one more detail here. So if a Laplace transform comes with a region of convergence, how are we sure? Because we're about to start going and doing tons of algebra with uh, Laplace transforms. So that seems a bit dodgy. If we've got something that's only valid for certain values of s, surely we have to be very careful about um, any algebraic manipulations we're doing. Maybe we're going to start producing poles in other places. How can we be sure we're not going to run into any mess? And um, this is sort of mopped up by something called analytic continuation and we'll put a another video, not made by me, uh, about this to sort of give you a bit more insight into that. Um, but sort of the, the bottom line here is that one-sided transforms cover everything we need. The region of convergence, we always know if we go far enough to the right in the s-plane, um, we'll, we'll end up in the region of convergence. So we're, we're sure that we can find a region of convergence somewhere, um, unless we start putting in un-Laplace transformable um, signals. Um, and by sticking consistently to positive signals and one-sided Laplace transforms, we can then just, through an analytic continuation, we can just forget about this whole issue of region of convergence and just ignore it, which is because um, we know it's going to converge somewhere and we know we can extend it to all other values of s using analytic continuation. So we can sweep this away and never talk of it again. And that is indeed what we're going to do. But uh, now you know a little bit more about uh, some of the machinery um, going on behind the scenes.